one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up here real quickly is that the name of the of um, of the presentation is we kind of put this together uh, the name of it or just, we're thinking about what to do um, about two maybe three weeks ago and um, frankly I'll tell you how the sausage is made here is that you know we're we're dealing with uh, working from home and that's changed sort of how uh, we view security has changed our posture um, and I didn't really know what I was going to talk about because quite frankly we're, we're everybody's trying to figure out where the problems lie and what the solutions are so it turns out that I've been running some virtual roundtables. Um, and what I really did is I synthesized all of the information that I got from them, anonymized, obviously. And uh, I kind of put it together in, in this presentation because I thought it would be useful to share with everybody else um, how a lot of your peers uh, in different uh, geographies are kind of looking at where we are today. And then put a little bit of my own spin on top of it. So, this is going to be a lot, it's going to be fairly informal. Um, and I mean, honestly, this is just like any new evolving situation or technology where we're all trying to figure things out. So it's always good to share information. So um, I'm not going to spend as much time telling you what I've heard because I would like to hear from you all, uh, get questions, um, maybe have you, you all sort of contribute a little bit. I think it's useful in, some, in these type of situations that are evolving that we all collaborate, uh, collaborate and, and sort of figure out um, what the solutions might be. So, I hope that makes sense for everybody. And let's jump right into it then. So, the first thing is, obviously, um, not everybody, nobody really anticipated. What I found out from talking to people is that almost, almost everybody has a business continuity plan, right? Um, however, one of the things that, that was not anticipated in the BCP was a pandemic, although a lot of them had a pandemic in it, it was, it was less about, nobody really anticipated that everybody was gonna be sequestered in their houses and we were gonna to have to deal with this whole working from home problem, right? So, um, so that's what we're kind of in the middle now, that's what a lot of people are facing and it's what I'm hearing from a lot of our customers and it's been obviously the topic of some of our panels. Um, one interesting statistic that, so in, and by the way, none of this is a sales pitchy thing or anything like that, right? But uh, for those of you who don't know what BitSight does, we gather data from all over the place. We have botnet sinkholes, we do, we have a web crawler and a port scanner. Um, we, uh, we, we grab all kinds of data from all over the place into a big, what I call a big ass data lake. Um, so we do that, but we also footprint um, organizations, any organization uh, on the planet we find out what their IP address footprint is, and then we merge them together with all these observations. And now we can say that organization, you know, Acme uh, has been infected by botnets. They have three risky open ports across their infrastructure. Um, they're not very good at managing certificates, you know, all those kind of things. So we're basically providing, um, and, and we percolate that up into, a, uh, into an overall rating, sort of like a consumer credit rating so that you can actually look at your third parties or yourself and decide how your program is actually operating. So you think about it this way, right? You, you look at everything internally, you do phone scans, you do all that kind of stuff, and then you decide what kind of security controls you should put in place. You implement the technology, the processes, and then you go about business, right? And monitoring things, et cetera, et cetera. We're looking at it from the outside and say, okay, you've got all these things in place, but what actually happens on the internet? What kind of data is leaking? What kind of vulnerabilities can we see from the outside? Are you getting botnet infected and you're not catching it? And we actually sit with this in cold, that kind of stuff. So we're gathering a bunch of data uh, is what it turns out. Um, and so one of the things that we find is that 95% of infected machines, particularly those that are infected by botnets or adware and spyware on uh, browsers or port scanning activity, you know, random port scanning, hitting the internet and things like that come from uh, consumer devices that are on home networks. That's important because as we start to work from home, we understand that people are getting into their home systems um, and we're not, they don't really know what to do with employees who are working from their house. So, uh, so here's what people are actually telling us. They're telling us that um, when they send their employees home with a corporate laptop, in many cases, right? So, you know, 80% of the cases, that's how it works. There's this low trust environment and the company doesn't necessarily trust the endpoint, even if it's a corporate device, right? So, and the other thing that's happening is that 
some employees are using their personal devices from their home network to access company resources. So that poses a different risk as well, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So there, those are two things that, uh, that people are worried about. And it's what I hear the most, quite honestly. Um, and along with that are things like there's no content filtering. Uh, so if you're in the corporate network, you can actually, you know, presumably you have some sort of application firewall or some sort of content uh, filter, some sort of proxy that you force your employees through. That's no longer the case necessarily, right? There's a lot of technologies that can make this happen. So in general, though, you're not really, you're not enforcing perimeter content filtering. So the employees can go do whatever they want. Or the kids can, uh, your kids can come and use the corporate laptop if you don't lock it down. Um, we know that physical security, when uh, that goes out the, out the window, then all bets are off, right? So if you give me physical access to your home network and, you know, about an hour and a half, I will own your, I will own your equipment one way or the other. So they worry about a lot of, a lot about that, but also when kids are, you know, kids or your spouse or roommate or partner or whatever it is, whatever your living situation is, they're doing things that might be a little bit risky. So example, my wife, who is pretty well up on security, but she obviously shares the whole network here. She's a yoga instructor and massage therapist, lucky me, right? But um, she, she's not a cybersecurity person. But I, you know, I drill it into her. However, every once in a while she'll come to me and she goes, hey, I just saw this thing where they'll give you money. Uh, the government's giving you money if your business is closed down. Being a massage therapist, of course it is. Um, and so she goes, I'm gonna go apply for it. And I was like, whoa, 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 before you start clicking on links, let's go see what's going on there, right? So turns out it was, it was uh, valid, so that's fine. But um, you never know. You never know what's happening in your network. So, um, so again, it's endpoint security, user awareness, the pollution of your network itself or the hygiene of your network. Uh, talking to one of the customers on these, uh, these virtual roundtables, he said that, and they're in the law, uh, they're a law office and a consultancy. What he said was that they're used to doing things like printing and scanning documents and all that kind of stuff. So they bring their laptop home when they're used to working in the office. And they're like, I want to hook up my laptop to this scanner that I bought or to this printer or, or it's a wireless printer. And any of you who've ever set up a printer in the last five years or so, by the way, little side rate, I hate printers. We need to get rid of printers. Absolutely. Nobody should print anything anymore. Just give everybody uh, iPads and we don't have to worry about printers and ink ever again. That's my view on the world, by the way. Um, and you would think, incidentally, printers being as aged as they are, right? So we've had printers for years and years and years. You'd think it would be a perfect technology at this point where you wouldn't have to deal with all the junk that we have to deal with the printers. But somehow HP hasn't figured it out. So what are you going to do? So, but people do want to hook up their printers. So I go out and buy a printer. There's one right behind me. And uh, it's got a wireless in it. And it wants to be a wireless access point. It just doesn't want to be a wireless client. So, you know, now you've got that point of presence. So I can go park outside my house now, uh, connect up to this printer. Now I'm on the internal network. Here's my corporate laptop. Uh, if I can break into that somehow and slide down the VPN, I've got a point of presence on my corporate network. Bang, done. Perfect crime, love it. Um, so uh, we already talked about physical security, but another thing is that regulations may actually force uh, physical security. So for example, PCI comp compliance, if you have cardholder data anywhere, you must have physical security over those devices. So you automatically give it up if you're allowing, uh, if you have PCI compliance and there are corporate employees who are working from home accessing any sort of PCI data and other, it's not just PCI, it's other uh, regulations and contracts. <coughs> Excuse me. The last thing that we're hearing is that employees are worried that when this thing is all over, they're going to pick their laptops up and go back into the office and now the IT security team or the incident response team or SOC or whatever it is that you're using, um, they're going to deal with just a massive amount of, of infections that just get dumped onto the corporate network the day that everybody returns. So how do you deal with that particular problem? So I sort of, uh, there are some other issues that we've heard from our customers in these tech round tables. Um, one of the first ones is that most companies don't have the resources to both shift their operations, you know, to support work from home and come up with a strategy for the work from home and implement that strategy. So everybody's sort of fighting fires right now, trying to figure out, you know, how do I enable employees? How do I keep business going? How do I, how do we continue to make money so we can pay for the employees in the first place, right? Um, I've also heard, and, by, and it manifests itself in different ways for different industries. So healthcare, for example, talking to a hospital, they said they sent about 30% of their employees home 
Uh, but if you think about those employees actually have access to, you know, uh, they're doing billing, they're accessing medical records, they have highly sensitive information and potentially PCI data, right? Because you take credit cards from customers um, that are all being sent back to their home and who knows what their home means. In fact, we have somebody, there's a colleague of mine, uh, at least one colleague, who her roommate uh, is a nurse. So the nurse comes and goes, you know, so she's going to the hospital and then coming back home. Um, and she does some work from home, but she also does some work there. So who knows what kind of stuff is being brought back and forth. It, both, by the way, both, <laughs> both, from a both from a human virus perspective and from a computer virus perspective. So, so interesting. Uh, manufacturing still has to uh, deal with plant operations and supply chain issues. Retail is, you know, kind of coming and going. So everything's spread out all over the place. You know, at least from, from a bit site perspective, we're a technology company. It wasn't that hard for us to all say, let's go all work from home. You know, we all have laptops. A lot of us are in sales, so we're kind of road warriors. We've been enabled anyway. Um, we've had the technology on our laptops to prevent them from being compromised to begin with. And we'll talk about that in a second. Although there's no such thing as a perfect solution, right? So, um, so depending on where you are, what sort of industry, there may be a lot of different uh, factors to, to be aware of. And there's no one size fits all solution. So just to be clear about that. Um, another thing that people are worried about is how do you distinguish between the company provisioned assets when they're on the home network versus when the company's using personal assets? So uh, this is a, not a very well kept secret, but I am on my personal home computer right now. My bedside computer is beside me. Um, it's just a bigger screen here. It's easier to use and all that good stuff. But how does the bitsite uh, IT security team know that I am violating company policy by using uh, my own personal computer? Aside from the fact that if they watch this webinar, then they can, uh, they, they'll call me up afterward. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. There's also interesting other problems, right? Like IoT devices. And I should have put a poll in here, by the way. But So who's got IoT devices on their home network? You know, Nest, uh, Nest. what else do I have? I've got Philips Hue lights. Uh, I've got a door lock that's connected. If you want to break into my house, go ahead. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? I don't even know what I have. Oh, I have a car. My car is connected to my network. So it gets updates over the, over the wire, uh, over the air actually. So there's a lot of things that are here. They're all, um, they're all weaknesses in my infrastructure where somebody could break in. And as we know, and I could go on for hours about this, Donna will tell you, um, IOT devices, people who write uh, software are not very good at building hardware. People who build hardware are not very good at writing software. So there's a lot of problems with IOT devices. So. So we have to assume that the network is polluted. Um, the other thing people are talking about that's not security related is that with working from home, um, network performance actually might be degraded. And I've actually seen a little bit of uh, problems because even though technically Verizon or whoever it is that you're getting your, your uh, home networking from, you know, they sell you things like 100 meg up and 100 meg down. The problem is that it all congests back in the core and there's a local core and then there's a central core many central cores, but um, so for my neighborhood, as it goes all, all back to a core, it's starting to get congested. I can tell that. So there's a, there's a productivity and performance issues. Uh, so that's, that's something people are concerned about. And then are employees actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are they playing golf? Well, you can't play golf anymore. So no. Or are you uh, like this guy in the screen who doesn't know how to get out of his hammock because he's drank too much, I guess, you know, so is, well, how is productivity um, for customers and, and security and productivity, by the way, are closely related. We'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, there are a lot of uh, industries that are furloughing employees. And so now you've got a resource drain on your workforce. And um, in some cases that might work to security's advantage, right? So a lot of the uh, people who aren't contributing to security, if, they, if they're no longer working at the company, then you don't have to worry about them anymore. But at the same time, um, you know, it also means that uh, as your company stops making money, then your job is in jeopardy too. So, so people worry about the resource constraints when it comes to uh, furloughed employees. So if I synthesize this all down, what we're really saying is that you're losing visibility as people move away from your corporate network. Um, the employees, you have to assume that they're conducting uh, practices that are not uh, in, a, in, a, in line with your security po uh, policies. There really is no perimeter anymore, although I would argue that you never had a perimeter, you know, in the last 15 years, we haven't had a perimeter anyway with cloud and mobile and uh, everything else. Um, but at the same time, now 
now we know that people who aren't used to working from home are, are working from home and they don't necessarily know how to uh, maintain security. And then finally, the last thing is that threat actors are starting to take advantage of, of this whole thing by using COVID-19 as a pretext for phishing emails. So I've seen a few of those myself and uh, it's actually fairly effective. They, uh, you know, how, how much more phishing is your organization um, being subjected to and how successful are you or your employees being at, oh, this is another uh, ring, uh, another device, my uh, front doorbell, just somebody walked in front of my house. So how effective is your phishing and how much more phishing are you detecting that phishing is, uh, phishing schemes are actually increasing as you go along. So monitoring those kind of things is really important because it helps you to get a sense of where you should start to uh, focus your efforts. Uh, so all of that is sort of what I would consider to be the main challenges that, that we're seeing. So what people are asking, um, and you know, again, on these, uh, on these uh, round tables is, you know, with employees not working in the office, what are the new challenges you're dealing with? How are you addressing them? So I'm actually asking those questions to the, the participants. How are you monitoring your enterprise assets on information where you have no control? What networks are you collecting and how are you analyzing those things? Um, do you think that uh, employees with different roles are at greater risk? Um, and which ones are already armed for remote work? People like road warriors. So are you thinking about the fact that you've got different types of employees and how are you dealing with them differently? And then how are risk postures for your third party? So do you know what's happening? You know, everybody's ecosystem nowadays is many, many third parties. Almost everybody uses some sort of outsourced HR, Workday, um, Paylocity, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you're, you have all kinds of different vendors for many, many things. Are they, are, are they taking care of security appropriately so that you're not inheriting that uh, transitive security problem from them? So are you actually stepping up your, your view of third parties? Um, and then finally, teleconferencing, that's the big one. So what new risks does teleconferencing bring and how are you managing them? We're on Zoom today, are you worried about Zoom? Uh, I'll tell you what I think in a moment. That's called the teaser folks. So just sort of paint a picture because that's a lot of words, right? And uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm doing something with ADS next week and uh, I've mixed things up and I thought I had a week to do put this presentation together. I usually make them prettier than this. Um, but I, uh, I thought I was going to be doing a roundtable for ADS today and this presentation next week. So Donna, that's why I was talking about that yesterday. So I pulled it together though, just for you. Uh, so this is sort of a picture of a working from home network, right? So you've got the employee's laptop. Hopefully you've got some sort of security on it. Um, you've got, you know, your employee's partner, roommate, uh, spouse, whatever it is, kids on their tablets, playing games, clicking on any link that happens to come their way. Don't forget, you've got smart TVs and all that kind of stuff. All in the same network, going through a home router. You know, and you might be going to the company network, you might be using Office 365, some cloud services, other things like that, Slack, whatever. You might be reading New York Times and Facebook. Uh, Facebook, anybody use Facebook anymore? I don't. Um, so pick the social media platform of your choice, but your kids are gonna be clicking on anything that might be going to EdelMonkeys or something. By the way, there is an evil, EdelMonkeys.net and .com. Don't click on them, I have no idea what they are, but uh, I just, I thought it was an interesting uh, name for a bad site, but apparently somebody else did also. So all of that's out there, right? So how do you actually keep track of um, what the hygiene is of those networks and make sure that you're not inheriting some extra risk? So what the participants have been telling me, so it's really interesting. The participants have been anywhere from CISOs to CIOs to senior managers or directors of uh, IT security. But then there's also been quite a few people who are in charge of day-to-day -day security. So it turns out that the CIOs and CISOs largely are thinking about it in terms of technology and sort of delegating it down to their tech, to their operations folks, right? And so it's interesting that they really had more of a voice on these roundtables where I would have, the, the technology folks, where I would have thought that from a government's perspective, I would have gotten more input from CIOs and CISOs, which is, has not yet been the case, right? I keep hoping that that'll happen. But I think, again, everybody's sort of wondering um, everybody's sort of wondering whether, uh, what they should do. What's this, what does this new normal mean? And how do I deal with it? So what I've been hearing from a technology perspective is that it's really about the endpoints. And that makes perfect sense, right? So, um, and people talk about antivirus. I hate the word antivirus. I think antivirus is dead. You know, long live anti the next generation antivirus, right? Um, but, you know, people are using things like semantic and sophos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
which are really, I would consider to be endpoint firewalls nowadays because they're not just signature-based antivirus anymore, right? So, so people are relying a lot on that. And then a little bit more um, on the endpoint detection and response side. And sometimes it's behavior-based, things like CrowdStrike, Falcon. You know, I'd even maybe put Silence in there, even though they call themselves next generation um, antivirus. Because they are sort of behavior-based, you know, AI, they look at the different types of files and determine whether or not they're malicious. So people are using that quite a bit. And then they're relying quite a bit on VPNs. And I haven't really looked at the stats, but I know that um, there are a lot of people who are still using um, traditional gateways or gut concentrators, you know, think about Cisco ASAs or Citrix. Uh, I can't remember what Citrix is called anymore. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in security ops per se. Um, but people are using that kind of stuff uh, at the data center um, for the business, you know, to sort of give a, a remote presence on the internal network like they've had before everybody went to work from home. And the smart people are all using full tunnel, so not split tunnel. And for those of you who don't know what that means, means that once you, you're on your corporate laptop at home, once you enable the VPN, all traffic goes down to the corporate network in a full tunnel mode. And then it comes back out the um, corporate perimeter versus split tunnel, which would be, you know, anything that's bound for the corporate network would go through the VPN. Anything that's not would go straight out to the internet. So if you're browsing, if you were using BitTorrent, it would go straight out to BitTorrent and start downloading files. But if you're going to, you know, your email at the company, it would go down to VPN. So split tunnel provide, it brings more risk um, ostensibly, and it also it doesn't give you a great uh, a great perspective or great analytics on how the employee's laptop is being used. So, for example, your kid walks up to you, you go to the bathroom, and you end up having a conversation with your spouse. And uh, so, the laptop's not being used for ten minutes. You don't have the screen lock. Your kid walks up, starts pounding on it. Then you go out to some site, you know, EvilMonkeys.zzz as I had before. They download some malware, um, and then that malware uh, starts to scan systems. It finds its way down that VPN tunnel. And now you've got a problem on your corporate network, potentially. So, whereas with full tunnel mode, if they try to browse to that bad site, hopefully it goes down the tunnel, tries to go back out the corporate firewall where you have uh, content filtering, and it prevents that particular um, that connection from happening because of policies. So, we're also seeing things like cloud-based VPNs, and you know. I don't know if they're technically VPN, but things like Zscaler, right, where it's effectively a corporate perimeter uh, that you install the, the Zscaler, Zscaler client on your laptop. It goes through the Zscaler gateway and out onto the internet, but it does web content filtering, firewalling, and all that for you automatically. So, um, so having that kind of content filtering is super useful as well. We're seeing a lot of customers use that. Um, one note, though, is that some of our customers have said that some VPNs don't work very, or some apps don't work very well with VPN. So your mileage may vary. You need to be, uh, when you start enabling VPN, you may run into some app uh, access problems. So just be aware. Also having a lot of customers talk about uh, cloud, um, cloud access security brokers. So things like Netscope, where they're basically trying, uh, trying to prevent um, their employees from going to insecure cloud uh, services and also sending out sending data to the cloud that shouldn't be there. Related, we've seen people using things like DLP, and they'll use that everything from web browsing to make sure people don't uh, go to you know send data to the wrong places, email stuff, whatever. Um, to also uh, restricting USB drive um, access, so people can't just copy files on USB drives, copy it somewhere else, and then obviously your data is gone somewhere. So DLP seems to be you know down the list a little bit, but it's there. And then we're seeing people who haven't already enabled two-factor authentication to VPN and cloud services, starting to enable that now. Um, so two-factor authentication, always a good idea. Uh, not perfect, don't get me wrong. Um, if somebody compromises your phone, you know, so if you start downloading Android APKs from random sites, then, uh, and your two-factor authentication sends a uh, out-of-band text, then the attackers can actually, they might have a point of presence on your phone, they can grab that two-factor authentication, log in before you do, and we've seen that happen in the past. So. It's not perfect, but it's better than just a pure password. So, so those are technology controls. Um, from a policy and process perspective, we're seeing that customers doing things like segmenting their user population. Um, so, and they might've been doing this beforehand. So into different role-based segments. So things like, uh, you know, a company, so people who need access to restricted data might be, you know, put into one uh, segment and, you know, into one role, people who don't need any uh, access and then people who are kind of in the middle go into the sort of middle ground. 
So being able to restrict where they get to over the VPN, either by segmenting the corporate network or segmenting their access once they get through the VPN, because um, we're seeing a fair amount of that as well. And one customer told us that uh, they only allow port 443 across the uh, VPN. If they try to get through on port 80, it redirects to 443. Um, and for those employees who need pretty much full-blown access to the corporate infrastructure, they're putting an RDP server on the end of the, uh, the VPN, so it's behind the VPN gateway, so not, a, not accessible to the internet in a perfect world, and um, letting their employees, this should be 3389, by the way, report. Um, they're letting their employees go out there and go to that RDP server and then use that as a point of presence, you know, sort of a virtual desktop environment, and be able to have access to the internal network. So they're using it as sort of a jump server, um, but requiring VPNs to get to that thing in the first place. Um, we've seen some customers used to allow access to webmail and they're starting to block access to it and forcing their users to go through the VPN gateway is a consequence of that. Um, and then we're also seeing from a policy perspective, because of the increased phishing, uh, we're seeing that the customers are starting to step up their phishing uh, exercises using COVID-19 as a pretext to see how well their employees have been inured to, uh, to, that, to that particular to the situation effectively. Um, they're also doing things like looking at how much uh, more reporting is being done on real phishing exercises and then starting to categorize those into COVID-19 versus traditional types of phishing exercises to see from a baseline perspective before this whole thing started to see how much more at risk or in jeopardy their customer or their employees are. Uh, we are also seeing a fair amount of um, work from home training. Most of our customers have done some initial work from home training before they send their customers home or once they sent them home, they got them all on a big uh, company-wide training thing. Um, and we're seeing that the ones who are a little bit more mature are conducting regular work from home security and productivity training exercises. In fact, at least at BitSig, um, we have had a number of trainings and uh, because I've been working from home for years and years and years, both at home in the office, on the road, whatever. Um, we did a, uh, a lunch and learn where we talked about different ways uh, that you can be still be productive, work from home, and be secure at the same time. You know, things like always be camera ready. So don't shuffle in in your pajamas, um, and uh, and always comb your hair. You, take, you don't have to take a shower every day, by the way, but please brush your teeth. That's always a good. Even though these are high, great. these are very high standards. <laughs> All right, so just brush your teeth. That's all I have to say. Yeah, we need to bring it down a little. <laughs> well, I always like to be camera ready. So I, and by the way, on most of my meetings, I actually have people do a pants check uh, because I want to make sure that everybody's dressed, right? So you got to stand up and show that you're actually fully dressed. Mm -hmm. So um, we also see that business continuity training emails are covering a variety of topics, not just security, you know, which is important, but productivity and mental health is pretty important. I don't know about you all, but I'm starting to feel a little bit, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm, I, I, it's, it's weird. I have a weird feeling. You know, it feels like you're in a weird movie, but it's going so slow that it's not particularly interesting. And yet at the same time, it feels like there's this gloom that some, sometimes comes over you. So there are people who are having much more severe mental health issues. I just, I'm just a little bit crabby, that's all. Um, so it's important to start thinking about that. Does that relate to security? Absolutely. When people start to get, uh, when they start to get frustrated or they start to break down mentally, they can start to exhibit dangerous behaviors. Um, they can have sort of have a all is lost attitude and just start doing things that are actually purposefully destructive to the company. So being able to monitor mental health is pretty important as well. So speaking of which, let's talk about monitoring and analysis. Um, and I'm going to break all this down, right? I know that I'm giving a lot of uh, words and things here, but um, so one of the things that's important is being able to gain a sense of what's happening by looking at data. So capturing the data from the endpoints, and we've had customers who say they use Sysmon or grab event logs from endpoints, um, and they stick it in their SIM, you know, even things like phishing exercises, whatever. So there's a lot of things that you can grab as data points and just sort of see where your, where your problems lie. So for example, if you're using something like Zscaler, and I, I'm not an admin for Zscaler, but I'm pretty sure they have an API that you can start pulling logs from it. You can determine that I'm not on my corporate laptop because you would see that my day-to-day uh, -day activity has gone down on my corporate laptop. You have no visibility into my personal laptop. 
Um, but you also see that uh, I'm skewing my calendar and see that I'm scheduled for all kinds of things that people know that I show up for or not. And then you can kind of infer from that that I'm not using my corporate laptop and that I'm becoming a higher risk to the company as a consequence of doing that. So, so looking at, think about all the kinds of ways that you can get data and sort of get a sense of what the employee is doing. It doesn't have to be the laptop. It could be the VPN logs. It could be uh, how many uh, accesses to files are out there. You know, I think about the Bradley slash Chelsea Manning story uh, way back, you know, when, before when Chelsea was to Bradley. Um, you know, he was accessing way more uh, documents than he should have as an army analyst. You know, 750,000 if I remember correctly. So let's just say you could access 200 documents a day during your job. Let's say you're, let's say you're, you're on some pretty good drugs, maybe 500. 500 into 750,000 is a lot of days. Um, and so all of a sudden 750,000 documents were accessed, stuck on a CD and walked out of the facility, right? So if you're monitoring the volume of, and maybe even the velocity, how quickly it is consuming those documents, you might be able to figure out that there's something bad going to be happening. So looking at file access patterns on premise and in the cloud, looking at user uh, behavior, um, for things like, is the employee doing things they shouldn't, or is somebody actually trying to break into my corporate environment? You know, the corporate laptop is in the work from home. Um, is is pretty interesting uh, way of monitoring stuff. You know, as I pointed out, it could be any kind of metrics. You might actually even look at, you know, if your consumers are using a particular application or set of applications that are being provided by you as a company, how often do they access them? How many uh, transactions do they create a day? How many records do they access? How many click-throughs do they have? Whatever it is that you have. Looking at things like what's their time, you know, and by the way, time is different. It might have been, you know, six months ago that they worked from nine to five and they never accessed the system afterward or whatever. And now from work from home, people might get up early in the morning and then take, you know, the midday off and go, you know, work out or hang out with their family and then work late into the night. So you may have to adjust your expectations by re-baselining because this new normal is going to change things. I get that. Um, also looking at things like volume, again, how many records are taking, velocity, how quickly they're grabbing records. So I think I sort of made those points. Uh, we already talked about looking at phishing statistics. Um, and then the one thing that we've talked about is roles and responsibilities and being able to determine how many employees have regimented uh, schedules and how many of those are just project-based and may choose to, to change their, their regimen now that they're uh, home regimen. So um, being able to sort of factor that in. So if, for example, somebody who's a call center employee is taking calls all the time, right? And when they, they log out, they actually have to log out of their system and say that they're not available. You know, so you can actually monitor how many calls are taking, see when they're working, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can correlate that with uh, you know, productivity. You can correlate that with um, you know, security because depending on what they're doing at any given time, you know, if, they're, if they're taking calls, but you're not seeing that activity on the corporate laptop, they're not using their corporate laptop. So things that you can do for that. Whereas somebody like me who's project-based, it's a little bit harder, but uh, again, there are ways that you can grab that data. So another couple of things that we're actually seeing here is that uh, um, when we talk about monitoring and even security, I've heard from a couple of people that they are in crisis mode. They're putting out fires and they really don't even have any time to start thinking about new tactics to monitor for security or to even start to monitor or to even start to uh, set up new security endpoint uh, configurations or whatever for this new normal. So, so if you if that's the way you're feeling, you're not alone. A lot of people are in the same situation. But do what you can when you can. One of the things that I've been advocating for a long time, and I worked at IBM for five years, um, and one of the things that they have is the ability to do sentiment analysis on social networks. So I'm not saying go do this, but I'm saying that you uh, you might want to consider monitoring your employees' social networks, at least things like Twitter, um, the ones that are just out there, you know, things that you don't have to friend them because that's a little bit of a corporate violation. And just look for, there are sentiment analysis uh, platforms out there who will look to see if somebody's becoming depressed or angry, or even if they're starting to leak information about your company to the internet. All of those are indicators that they are not conforming to policies, they're ready for a meltdown, whatever it is. So um, looking at that kind of stuff is super useful. Um, I also think that any other publicly available data source where you can tie it back to an employee is something, as long as it's, it's not um, against the law or against your contract, your employment contract with uh, your employees, 
then it's fair game. And as long as you're doing it for the better interest of the company and the employee, I say go do it. By the way, this does not constitute legal advice. Uh, I am not speaking on behalf of Bitsight at this point when I say that. So your mileage may vary. That's Chris, please don't sue me. Uh, and then I've heard that a lot of companies are, are starting to think about brand monitoring kind of adjacent to that as well. Um, and some have been required to do it for many years anyway because of regulations or contracts such as the FFIEC. So we're starting to see a little bit more of that interest in that kind of stuff. And then let's jump into teleconferencing for a second. Uh, I've been surprised at how few respondents have actually worried about Zoom. Um, and so let me just take a moment. Uh, this is a public service announcement by Chris and tell you my thought on that. So it's like driving on a crowded highway. You know, Zoom has been pretty popular in the consumer space as well as the, uh, the corporate space for a while. Yeah, they've been the darling, you know, before that it was GoToMeeting, before that, who the hell knows. Um, but at the end of the day, here's the thing. When this whole thing hit, everybody flocked to Zoom. So that's where the, the threat actors went, right? And they were looking for ways to, to take advantage of the platform because it's the most popular one. It's like being in the slow lane, right? Everybody's in there and then you see the fact that the lane beside you is moving a little quicker. So everybody's like, oh, let's get into that lane. So let's jump off of Zoom into GoToMeeting. So my prediction is that as people start to migrate off of Zoom on a GoToMeeting or whatever it is that's next, um, that the threat actors are going to start going there as well, and then we're going to find as many problems with that. And quite frankly, with Zoom, as far as I can tell, the big problems are that the default configuration has not been to have a password, so it's pretty easy to guess, you know, the, the, um, the meeting ID, and then Zoom bomb it, and then do things like play, you know, pretty raunchy uh, content, you know, just for, for lulls. Um, or, you know, in a more malicious sense, if you could get in without being detected, you could actually listen in on your competitors who are having a, you know, a corporate meeting or something like that. So as long as you put a password on it, fine. The second thing is they've said that they have end-to-end -end security, which I don't think Zoom's marketing actually understands what that means. I think what they think it means is that from your, from your computer to Zoom's core, it's uh, encrypted where we all know the end-to-end -end means from a Zoom participant through the core to the next Zoom participant, where Zoom actually cannot uh, see the decrypted uh, content, right? And people are starting, but if you think about how Zoom works, that's kind of, that's really difficult to do. So yeah, whatever, I'm not gonna judge them, but my point is that when people say, let's jump out of Zoom because it's insecure, uh, it's not insecure, it's a little bit of marketing, a little bit of secure, you know, configuration, and they use some servers in China too, so uh, we'll see whether Citrix does or not. So I'm not apt to get too up in arms about it. It'd be interesting to hear what you all have to say about it. But if you're in a sensitive industry, and I've talked to folks in the DOT and law firms, they've been using physical te teleconference units in private uh, WAN connections anyway for years and years. When I was at Booz, I know that I had one on my desk. I never figured out how to use it because I never bothered to but I know that everybody did because big DOD uh, consulting company. Uh, so they don't use commodity services to begin with. So that's my Zoom uh, story for you. And you can hate me for it or you can love me for it. It's absolutely up to you. So let me break this down. Most organizations have no idea how to cope with uh, this, this all in migration to work from home. And they really want somebody to tell them what they should do. So I sort of told you that at the beginning. So I'm gonna tell you what to do. So here's, if I were running the IT security uh, uh, team for your organization, I would do three things. And by the way, there's a great book out there called uh, Core Business, C-O-R-P-S, like the Marine Corps. In fact, it's about the 30 uh, management principles that the Marine Corps uses to get things done. And one of them is rule of three. Don't give anybody more than three things to do at any given time because they're not gonna be able to do it. That's just the way humans are, are wired. So. So here's three things for you to do. Of course, I've broken them down into sub things, so it's really six things to do, so there you go. Um, and first one is lock down remote access to the enterprise infrastructure and the data. When I say enterprise infrastructure, I mean both on-prem data center and cloud services. So in other words, don't just let me on my personal computer go uh, say, hey, I wanna get access to my Gmail account for corporate use, uh, here's my password, and bang. Now all my corporate Gmail is on my personal computer. Don't let people do that. Uh, don't let them, don't expose an RDP server to the internet and use that as a jump uh, system that people can then get access to systems behind it. Use a real VPN, use two-factor authentication or client-side certificates, whatever it is that works best for you. So really lock things down so that 
I mean, think about it. Your premise, your physical premise right now, uh, premises, is for all intents and purposes, is a ghost town. So if I can pick locks and nobody's watching me, I can wander around in there and just steal stuff. Um, so the thing, same thing is true from a, a digital perspective, right? There's nobody there. Just both a, um, an opportunity, it's a threat and an opportunity. The opportunity is there's gonna be less traffic, so there's less noise, white noise for you to look at. So actually looking at traffic that's going through your corporate backbone right now is probably super useful and interesting. So, um, and then of course, this allow remote access except for approved devices, I already sort of covered that. So make sure your enterprise and cloud infrastructure is locked down. That you know how, you only give people a couple ways that they can get into it to try to prevent uh, them from using personal systems or for uh, unauthorized users to get into it. The second thing is put good endpoint protection on corporate systems, prevent split tunneling. We talked about them. Don't let them browse to the internet without going through the VPN. Um, make sure that whatever you install provides some sort of content and DNS filtering, or if you force them down the endpoint that you're, uh, that you're doing it out on the internet. The thing is about VPNs though, is that if somebody turns off the VPN, that laptop is just a laptop again, and presumably they can get out of the internet. So things like Zscaler can actually prevent that from happening. You know, it'll say, look, you're not allowed to go out to the internet unless you've got the VPN enabled. So, you know, make choices wisely about what endpoint protection you choose. Um, but I would say, make sure that's something that gives you the ability to pull logs off of there and as well as apply policies, right? But also run regular scans on those systems because if you're not watching it and they do manage to do something malicious or not malicious, something that infects it, make sure you have the ability to, uh, to scan that system on a regular basis and update software, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final thing, and we've talked quite a bit about this, is be able to monitor activity and behavior at endpoint in enterprise gateways. So again, determine what the new normal baseline looks like. Uh, I think I sort of beat that of course to death. And use that new normal to be able to involve the controls. Make that a decision point for, all right, now that we know what people are doing, what can we do to further protect our employees and our data um, now that we understand what their behavior looks like? So make it a full, a full closed loop. So last thing I'm gonna leave you with before our questions is, um, one of the things that we've done, which is kind of interesting in sort of sandwiching this, you know what we do at BitSight, because I told you up front. Um, so one of the opportunities we've had is because we're actually running a botnet sinkhole and we do port scanning is, we're able to detect on any given IP address whether there's infections uh, behind that firewall or that, uh, or that cable modem or, or whatever. Um, we can see it when, when a botnet reaches out to its command and control server, and we can also see uh, open ports. And so we actually put this feature in our, in our product, which allows you to go and grab your employees' home, um, home network IP addresses. So have them do a what is my IP, or if you have appropriate endpoint protection, where you can run that yourself and see what the what is my IP or whatever it is, tell them what the internet uh, address is. You can plug that in and, and by the way, you can also get that stuff from things like uh, Zscaler logs. You can get it from uh, your VPN uh, logs. There's a lot of places where you can get this information and find out what the public facing IP addresses of your employees, cable modems or Fios or whatever it is they use. If you plug those in, we can actually tell you things like, you know, in this particular case, I'm gonna move my Zoom thing, it's in my way, um, where it says this particular one, uh, the top one, potentially exploited, they're on Intel SAT SA, don't even know what that is, but it's a, some sort of a public provider. They're on port 49074, and the infection is RKSDK. I just happen to know that's an Android-based uh, piece of malware. So this particular, um, this particular IP address, which I've omitted, by the way, that we show the IP address as well, um, is running RKSDK. So that particular employee is on a network that's also infected by some um, uh, Android malware. Um, if I go down a little bit farther to this Jaguar communications one, I can see that this employee has SSH running exposed to the outside. We call it good because SSH is better than having Telnet, but the reality is you should probably go to that employee and say, why are you allowing somebody to SSH to your cable modem from the internet? That's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, we've got people running HTTP, PDP. So HTTP is probably for remote administration of their cable modem over clear text, very bad. We normally call it neutral because it's uh, HTTP is a neutral uh, protocol for corporate environments, but it's bad when it comes to uh, cable modems and, and work from home environments. <clears throat> somebody's running MySQL or at least exposing to the internet. Somebody's exposing their airport, uh, Apple airport administration utility to the internet. Anybody think that's a good idea? I don't know. 
um, SMB, NetBIOS, um, SSDP, universal plug and play stuff. So all of this is being exposed to the internet. So very bad stuff. So it gives you a sense of what you're dealing with from your, um, from your employees. So just sort of a feature that we threw in as a response to uh, work from home. So hopefully uh, that was useful to you. I know that when I've had these roundtables, it's been, uh, it's been enlightening to me and I've been surprised by some of the feedback that I've gotten from our customers. But so it's your turn now. I really wanna hear what you have to say uh, and answer any questions you have. So I'm gonna open it to the floor here and I'm not sure if we're taking questions uh, by audio or if we're just gonna do them by um, Zoom yeah. chat. We, ha we have actually the chat screen open um, okay. if anyone wants to ask some questions in there. There's a Q&A section. I haven't seen any come up yet, but. So somebody just asked. Just yep. oh. so, uh, so the way that this works in BitSight, so somebody asked, can you show one more time how you can scan a work from IP in BitSight? So we actually have a, um, there's a, a dialog box where you can put the IP addresses in. So we're, we don't actually go out and help you get the IP addresses because it could be from your VPN concentrator, it could be from Zscaler, it could be from, you might just ask your employees to send it to, you know, here, go run this thing. But once you have that list of IP addresses, you plug it in. And I have plugged in like, I think there were about a dozen IP addresses that I plugged in here to come up with this. <clears throat> and these are real findings, by the way. And so um, it'll show potentially exploited for us is adware and spyware. Botnet infections are actual botnet infections and open ports are exactly what you think they are. Um, and so we're, and we would show you the IP address just to the left where it says risk vector here. Um, I just removed it because, you know, protect the innocent at this point. Uh, and so over here on the side, and you'd be able to click in and see what RKSDK is and Robnix and all the different sorts of uh, botnet infections. Um, we would actually show you, for example, with SSH, uh, what the banner is for that SSH server. So if it said something like links this SSH uh, remote administration, you'd have a better sense of what, what's happening there. Um, same thing with HTTP, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd be able to see all of that kind of information, get some more forensic information in here as well. So I hope that made sense, uh, Patricia, or Patrick, sorry. Any other questions? Well, I have a question for y'all. Oh, oh, in search and ad companies field. In search and ad companies field. Oh, I see what somebody's asking. Okay, so I'm gonna do something a little bit here, hold on. Let me, uh, that person wants to see it in the platform is what they're asking. So, Patrick, didn't mean to call you a person, Patrick. I know you're a person, but didn't mean to anonymize you. So let's see. <laughs> Let me jump into my platform real quick. And let me switch gears here, new share. And let's go over here. Is it going to follow? No, it's not going to follow. Hold on a second. There we go. That's what I want. Did I do what I was supposed to do? No, I didn't. Ah, it doesn't matter. Who cares? All right. So fair enough. Uh, so here we are. I think you can see the BitSight platform. So what you do is you'd go into analytics, work from home, and then you would plug in IP addresses here. And I wonder, I wonder if I have any off the top of my head. Well, actually, let me do this since I'm here. Oops, stop it. I'll do two things first off. And by the way, you guys can't see this, but Zoom keeps getting in my way. So that's why there's like a little delay. So if I went over here and went, what is, oops, hello. What is my IP.com? Now y'all can attack me. <laughs> I trust you though. Plus I have a really good firewall. Remember that when we used to say a really good firewall was good enough? Where's my bit site? There we go. So if I plug that in, and I have, I actually have some other ones here, but that's me. Hey, my network came up clean. Look at me. I'm good to go. Uh, anybody want to give me their IP address to look at? See how whether or not your uh, your home network is clean. Happy to do it. You have to show it to everybody though. No. Let's see if I can find one. I don't want to implicate anybody in particular, but if you give me a second, I'll find you another one here. Uh, where did I put that? That's always a secret. Anybody here good at finding all their stuff in the cloud? I'm not. Hey, Chris, not to cut you off, I'm 
going to give you a two minute warning just because we have another one of these starting at the hour. So if anyone else has any questions, oh, somebody shared their IP as well. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to do two things. Let me, uh, let me grab these ones since I have a bunch here. There's also a question. Um, can I put a net block with cider? Uh, and uh, you can not to my knowledge. But that's a good question. Let's find out, shall we? Oops. Back. Just for the sake of this person's IP, I am going to stop recording. <laughs> See, he can feel that. Wow. <laughs> Don, I have to say, Donna is a professional. She has always, she always run the awesome events. I couldn't been. agree more. Uh, thanks, Chris. So if I wanted to see, let's go to that SSH one real quick, because that's fun. Let's see SSH one. So you can also do this, by the way. You can say open ports. You can look for specific open ports and things like that. So uh, look at SSH. Here we go. Here we go. I also made that. sure to hit record before you said that again. So. <laughs> yeah, you got that in recording. <laughs> so this person is running SSH. Uh, 7.2 patch level 2 on Ubuntu. So they probably have an Ubuntu system exposed to the internet somehow, which is kind of weird and interesting. But there is that. And then the last question you all asked was, can you do, can you just pick one of these and say, so 24, just for the sake of argument. I thought they were nope. talking about hard cider. <laughs> I like where you're going. <laughs> All right, so that's it for me, and I'm gonna see the floor. Um, I hope it's been useful for everybody. I really appreciate it, and if you have any feedback, comments, concerns, chris.poolin at bitsite.com, or you can always hit up the Atlantic Data. And uh, y'all have a good day, be safe, wear masks. Thank you so much, Chris.